Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Good afternoon and welcome to today's virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Linda Calhoun, Chair of the International Relations Forum and founder of CareerGirls.org. I'll be the moderator for today's program entitled Inside Perspective on the San Francisco Waterfront and its Impact Beyond the Bay Area. Uh, please go online to commonwealthclub.org for more about upcoming events and info about member-led forums. Um, please go to the chat in our YouTube channel and you can post questions for our sp speaker there. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Elaine Forbes, Executive Director, Port of San Francisco. She is a passionate champion and advocate for the San Francisco waterfront. An innovative and compassionate leader, she has provided a steady hand at the helm during a period of great change and a global pandemic. Mayor Edwin Lee appointed Director Forbes in 2016. Director Forbes is leading the port and public through a waterfront renaissance. Central to her work is ensuring that all new developments on the waterfront align with key port objectives of economic recovery, equity, and resilience. Director Forbes has worked to enshrine equity as a core port value, adding explicit equity commitments to the port strategic plan in 2016. She has led the effort to create a culture of inclusion, belonging, ex and excellence internally at the port with the explicit goal of making sure the port is an anti-racist organization and an equitable place to work. Deployed as a disaster service worker herself, along with hundreds of port staff and thousands of other city and county of San Francisco employees, she led the city's efforts to develop COVID-19 testing facilities. In fact, the first free public testing site in the United States was established on port property and at peak completed almost 2000 tests a day. Prior to her appointment, Director Forbes held executive leadership positions in several city and county of San Francisco departments. She worked in redevelopment, land use policy, and economic development for the city of Oakland and nonprofit organizations. She holds a master's degree with honors from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a bachelor's of arts degree with honors from Mills College in Oakland. And she is also a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. Dr. Director Forbes was born in San Francisco. So, Director Forbes, welcome to our program. Thank you so much, Linda. And thank you for inviting me here today. I'm just really excited to talk to you about the Port of San Francisco, because as you'll hear today, it's just such an important place. Some, some of our impacts obvious and others unseen. Well, before we get into our conversation more deeply, I'd like to play this brief video to give our audience an idea of the mission of one of the most important agencies <laughs> shaping the future of San Francisco that many may know little or nothing about. So can you play the video, please? The Port of San Francisco's waterfront stretches seven and a half miles. And while it seems like it will always be there, our waterfront needs us. San Francisco faces coastal flooding due to climate change, with an expected sea level rise of up to seven feet by the year 2100. We also need to strengthen the waterfront against urgent earthquake risk. The Port of San Francisco's Waterfront Resilience Program is leading a citywide effort to adapt the waterfront to address this unique combination of risks. What's at stake? Small businesses, nearby housing, open spaces and attractions, a national historic district, 
maritime and industrial uses, transportation networks like BART and Muni, critical drinking water and wastewater utilities, and disaster response facilities. Guided by a robust public engagement process since 2018, the port and city and federal agency partners have developed waterfront adaptation strategies for public review and engagement. Adaptation strategies are a combination of construction projects and policies to defend San Francisco against flood and earthquake risks to create a resilient, sustainable, and equitable waterfront for the next 100 years. We'll need to use different approaches depending on the unique characteristics of each neighborhood and shoreline area. Continuing to defend some locations against current and future flooding at the current shoreline while defending further inland in other locations to create space for expected future flooding. The port is committed to ensuring adaptation strategies create opportunities for San Francisco's historically underserved communities. We want residents to engage in decision making and benefit directly. We have a once in a generation chance to defend waterfront jobs housing and public spaces from floods and earthquakes and to reimagine the shoreline with more public open space, better access, improved mobility and enhanced bay ecology. Join the Port of San Francisco and let your voice be heard on the future of our waterfront. Learn more at sfport.com forward slash WRP. Well, that video gave us a brief overview of the port's mission and responsibilities. And I know that resilience and the adaptation strategies is just one big effort um, that the port is responsible for. And I know that the port is also really focused on economic recovery and growth, equity, and so much more. However, I'd like to start our conversation by having you please tell us more about the strategy and management of those 7.5 miles of San Francisco's waterfront. Well, thank you so much for asking that question. You know, the waterfront really today and into the future is very, very vital to the well-being of the city and the region. And it serves and supports a lot of public values that contribute to prosperity, innovation, and happiness, frankly, for the 24 million plus people who come and visit our, our shoreline. It's also a really defining feature for the city and county of San Francisco. And the San Francisco's innovative spirit has always started at our waterfront. Um, and we have innovated and spurred generational transformations here. But interestingly, many of our buildings and facilities, they're not changed much, substantially unchanged. So it makes the waterfront a really, really special place. Right now, our strategies, um, and operations and execution are changing because we're really having to adapt to COVID. Um, so we're planting and sowing seeds to emerge from really significant impacts of the COVID pandemic. Uh, do remember that we are a people moving and people wet welcoming operation. Uh, we have over 500 tenants and many of our tenants needed to close their shops during COVID. Um, so regaining a financial footing for the port organization and our tenants and partners is really a paramount concern right now. And we have to, while we're uh, recovering, ensure that our, our waterfront remains really safe, equitable, and vibrant. So we people, people come, they want to visit, and they want to return, and we're welcoming San Franciscans and regional residents to this beautiful place. We've laid out some really short-term tactical strategies in a waterfront activation plan across the board that really speaks to keeping the waterfront safe, clean, and vibrant um, so we can welcome and re-welcome visitors here. And this is really important as we consider revising and refreshing the ways in which we do business. We're also looking ahead as you've seen, to execute programs and projects that make us durable for earthquake and sea level rise. This is really the long game that we've been engaging in, and you'll hear, hear more about it today, but it's really planning for San Francisco's future waterfront. You'll hear me talk about our operations programs and policies across the board, because we manage seven and a half miles of waterfront as the custodian for the public. And that's a very important part to understand is that the Port Authority is a custodian of these waterfront properties for the public. Um, 
We have these day-to-day -day programs that I'm talking about. We have operations, we have maintenance, uh, we have the whole gamut that you would expect at a port. And we're also planning out 2100 and beyond. So the bottom line is we really strive for the waterfront to support the well-being of our communities. And this is from cruise ships to ferries to maritime commerce and industrial activities to Fisherman's Wharf to supporting swimming, fishing, boating, ecology, and habitat. So we are a diverse uh, set of operations uh, with a mission that is very clearly focused on a public accessible waterfront that is equitable and resilient. And I'll talk more about that. But I will say that Port is a place that tells the story of San Francisco. And we are right now evolving and writing our next chapter, which you will hear about. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Um, and I, that's really resonating with me, the custodian of yes. the, the water front for the public. Um, can you tell me or tell our audience, what's your favorite part of the work that you get to do, Director Forbes? Um, I think my favorite part is managing my leadership team and being a captain to the port organization and our employees. Um, we're 230, 230 strong. Um, we've been working really to develop more obviously breaking silos and developing really integrated strategy. Uh, so we're targeted in how we um, keep the waterfront as, as wonderful as it is, but also working on co-creating a mission with our teams, uh, with our staff teams, ensuring really um, an environment rich organization. So staff is really prepared and supported to make their best contributions and having uh, deep deep conversations about equity and leadership, uh, transparency, loyalty and accountability. Um, and I'm enjoying so much this work because my leadership team and their assist, their deputy directors and down through the organiz around the organization are experiencing a change in the way we uh, teamwork. And I feel that it's quite transformative in the results we achieve and also um, the inspiration of the folks who work here. Uh, so I will say my favorite part of the job is working with my team and, and working with our port staff. Wonderful. And, you know, thinking about the team that you've been able to build and lead um, in your time at the port, is there a project that you're particularly excited about and that your team has just been uh, really impactful in making happen? Well, I'm going to go back to the video you saw on it uh, because the resilience work is so critical and so generally generationally transformative. And, you know, we, um, we're on an urban waterfront. We have the seven and a half miles. And only six years ago, we knew we had a challenge. We have an over 100-year-old seawall uh, mm -hmm. that protects 500 acres of neighborhoods, city downtown, and big, big, big important infrastructure like Muni. Um, and we knew that old infrastructure needed replacement. And we've moved this program and this concept so far. I mean, we went from understanding we had earthquake risks and emerging sea level rise to getting us a bond from the voters of 425 million, which was really a down payment for us of how to how to prepare ourselves uh, for earthquake risk and sea level rise. And can I, can I stop yeah. you? How old is that seawall? The seawall is it was constructed over a century ago and it took about 30 years to build. Uh, so it depends on which sections, the age, but it was actually built by the state because San Francisco Maritime was uh, the, the vessels were having a problem and they were getting stuck in Bay Mud. Uh, so this the the state went out and built a seawall, as I said, really 500 acres out um, to get into deep water and built back into the into the city and filled uh, all those those acres. And that's one of the reasons why we have such intense earthquake risks, because these are unengineered soils um, and they're very deep. Um, 
so the seawall is old. It supported the original formation of the city, the port city that was really growing by water. Um, and it has a very interesting history because the, because the state built it, you see these very beautiful architecture for our bulkhead buildings. And the state chose a very beautiful um, uh, design, but behind it was a simple shed with break bulk cargo. And so it's very, what, what was happening in all those sheds was receiving product and bringing it out into the city by rail. Um, so that is the history of the seawall and, um, and what was going on at that time in the city. Um, but th so we knew we had an old seawall and we knew we had earthquake risk. We got our bond and we began really analyzing what needed to happen first and where the areas were both of most urgent earthquake and safety risk and most urgent flood risk. And from that bond, we did that analysis and we were able to identify the first 23 projects that had to happen. And that's a big, that's a big result for us understanding how these things will perform, our facilities will perform an earthquake overlaid with our flood risk. So I'm really proud of the team for figuring out all that, that analysis. And then we had the bold move and it was our commission's move and, and, and mandate that we look at our whole seven and a half miles of waterfront property, not just our three mile seawall, which protects a lot of city infrastructure. So we were able to do that and move to working with a federal partner in the Army Corps of Engineers we started just in conversation with them, and then we were able to earn a flood study, uh, which is when they come and look at our flood risk and work with community and us to decide how are we going to provide flood protection to San Francisco. And it's a very, very good process, and it's led us to be to a point where we're talking to the community about what values they want to see. Uh, for the city's next waterfront. And we're talking to young people because it will be their waterfront. And so we're at the point where we have adaptation strategies, which you saw in the video. And this is a way in which to decide, are we going to defend here? Does it make most sense to hold the line? Does it make most, uh, more sense to adapt and manage water? Or does it make sense to retreat? And up and down the waterfront, there will be different um, applications that will be best to achieve our goals. And this all could result in really big federal funding. Um, so we've gone from uh, telling the public we have challenges and risks, like major risks at the San Francisco waterfront, to having solutions and potentially a flood plan, a durable flood plan for our entire seven and a half miles of waterfront with federal investment. So this has been a journey at the port that has it's gone very well. And I'm uh, proud of that innovation. I know I'm giving a long answer. No, um, but that's great because I, I will tell you, it gives me as a as a resident in San Francisco, it gives me great comfort to see the degree of the custodial nature of the work that you're doing and this and the seriousness with a, of the stewardship, and you know, getting people to understand it's not one size fit all fits all. And also, we are way overdue <laughs> with the a earthquake. Sea wall that, yes. uh, that yes. was built in the last century. And yes. um, so it's I, I'm I'm glad that there's all this activity going on and that it's uh some of the favorite projects that uh, you and your team are working on. Yes. If I could if I could say it a bit more um this is an area where we were treading that we didn't really have a, a, a roadmap or a great uh, examples to look at. Though there, the Army Corps has done a lot of work around the nation, we really did need to put this program together um, with a lot of innovation. And we've had a lot of learning and I wanted to share a bit of that learning with you. Um, one is that our impact goes way beyond our port jurisdiction. So we're, you know, we're the Port Authority, we're out here with our seven and a half miles and flood protection wall. Um, but then we understood with this work how deep and wide the impact goes. And we also learned that these kinds of mega projects, we have to have the city agencies and the other partners with big infrastructure at the table. So that's been very important to understand as we kind of work out all the systems and all the impacts to various, you can imagine various decisions impact these um, utility systems. Um, 
And we're also learning we can't do it just on the public dime. We really need to have innovative approaches to how we build this new waterfront. So I'll talk about that. And finally, we we learned that public engagement is, is really critical and it can't just be the usual way we have to go out in innovative ways. We've been into community, we've been into preferred restaurants, we've been out in and talking with people at places they wanna engage in ways they wanna engage. So the public engagement has been really uh, a learning in terms of how to do it right. And we're getting there. Awesome. And I have no doubt (laughs) that um, as this work continues, it's really going to reflect what everyone um, is, is really, you know, wants to protect and preserve with our, our waterfront. Um, You, you've touched on this. I mean, our, our waterfront is iconic and, you know, I know that there are plans to protect with that seven feet mm-hmm. expected, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. sea rise by the uh, sea level by the end of this century. You know, what what's giving you, I don't know, fears about it? Where, where are you seeing, mm-hmm. yes, we're right mm-hmm. on point in mm-hmm. terms of planning for that eventuality? So um, I think the historic and iconic part, I want to talk a little bit bit about that because we have two historic districts, the Embarcadero Historic District and the Ironworks Historic District at Pier 70. And these are really, this is a one of a kind left uh, assemblage of break bulk facilities on the Northern waterfront and really a one of a kind facility, facilities at Pier 70 related to ship repair. And I'm really proud to say at Pier 70 for those historic districts, we work with public private partners to restore those facilities. Those buildings are just amazing buildings and to have the area high enough and safe enough to go out uh, to 2100 on sea level rise. So that is very strong in terms of the iconic nature and preserving that ship building history. We also have a beautiful park next door, Crane Cove Park, that really speaks to the history and looks to the future, uh, allowing folks to access the bay in new ways, which is fabulous. For our historic district on the Embarcadero waterfront, that three mile seawall stretch, there's challenges there. I I, I won't I won't uh, make it a rosier picture because they're challenging to restore. We've had some great successes, like at the Exploratorium, and obviously the Ferry Building. Um, we have uh, Pier 38 and 40 we're working with a development partner on in South Beach. Pier 38 is a beautiful, beautiful, uh, one of a kind, actually, in terms of its, its uh, frontage uh, building, and it's in a beautiful location. In the Northern Waterfront, we're working on various challenges on restoration related to how expensive it is to get it done. Um, and also with adaptation, how our bulkheads and our peers will work in that new picture because the historic height level of them and their historic nature only goes out so far. So one of the ways we're working on those uh, historic peers is we've done a study to see how can they adapt in their current height Like how far can you get them out with the right rails or the right ground floor that could flood like different, different methods and that can take the buildings out further. Um, And we're also looking for a development partner soon to be in the Northern waterfront pier. So I guess in summary, we've got a beautiful, beautiful, iconic, historic um, waterfront. Several of our piers have been rehabilitated uh, for, uh, for us and for uh, the future, and many of them have not. Um, And so our job, working with the public, working with our commission is to decide what is our future with these beautiful historic facilities? How do we welcome the public in? How do we respect um, their historic fab, the historic fabric and preserve that into the future? And in the Resilience Project, um, the port facilities, these finger piers will be outside of the line of defense for flood protection, because it doesn't make sense to flood protection each pier. So we're going to have to think about that as a, as the Port Authority and as the city, um, what is the future of these facilities? And likely at some point, we will have to say goodbye to them as sea levels rise above and beyond what we can what they can tackle. So very important question, um, not very and very important future discussions. Um, mm. And 
And speaking of those future discussions, you know, I'm just hearing you talk about even the the impact on commerce and economic activity. Can you tell us more about the key port objectives of economic recovery, equity, and resilience, and and how you incorporate them in the work that you do? I mean, you know, displacement that happens, um, you know, mm-hmm. making the the decisions about you know adaptation mm-hmm. and and what's defensible. How are you? Yes, yes. I mean, we're, we're always balancing the reality that we're an enterprise agency um, that needs to make our own revenue and be able to spend our own revenue and support our operations as a port authority, and also being able to deliver really big public benefits. So um, we understand our mission and our value. Um, and we also don't have the funding to pull it off, to tell you the truth, and nor nor have we uh, really ever had that. Um, it, our financial success has always relied on our own capacity, but also um, development uh, partners or federal or state funding. So I'll talk about that. So just for the enterprise part, I'm going to talk about economic recovery first, then I'm going to turn to equity. Um, so for economic recovery, as I said, we were hit so hard during the pandemic, just so hard. And so our strategy coming out of pandemic was support our tenants. So we moved right into the the position of shared prosperity is what we called it, the shared prosperity model. So we gave rent forgiveness. um, We helped out with shared spaces, uh, allowing for more outdoor dining uh, so we could keep our restaurants um, having a a customer base. Um, We uh, put in a a licensed vending program because we had a lot of vending um, activity, not not permitted, and we needed to get that um, into a permitted uh, fashion. So we did that. And we moved from, oh, and we provided loans. We provided loans uh, to those that needed uh, a bridge. Um, So now we're looking ahead with our tenants and we're really putting our energy into revival. So I did discuss the waterfront activation plan with a, a really key enumerated steps for safe, equitable, vibrant. We have as one example, 300 events coming in 2023. Uh, which is amazing. Some of them are year round and some of them are episodic, but we really need to get opportunities to remind people about what they love about living in the city and what they love about visiting the city. And that includes this waterfront. So that is our major short-term economic recovery strategy. For longer term, we're looking at changes to our spaces, um, investing in tenant and improvements in our our restaurants in order to bring in new kinds of businesses and de-risk retail and restaurant at this time. But we also do need to, in our economic recovery, understand and plan for the changes that the COVID pandemic will have on this waterfront in a a more um, sustained way. So we are looking to see what happens with the office market and what happens with restaurant and retail. So we're able to adapt our facilities um, to, you know, to respond and innovate, frankly, you know, we're in our economic recovery world, we're doing a lot of things like placemaking, um, working to bring, for example, BIPOC owned businesses out of District 10 came to our ferry building for the farmer's market. And that was a great opportunity for our local businesses to to be part of that and have our customer base because the ferry, the farmer's markets on Saturday are always booming. And we had a Juneteenth event, which was terrific and a fall harvest festival. So things like that, they're important moves because they integrate our local small businesses into the economics of our waterfront community. So that is our economic recovery uh, strategy. We have, um, we've just hired an economic recovery director because we're going to be doing this program in a very intentional way. And, you know, sustaining our enterprise and sustaining our tenants and our operations We'll have various strategies and we're going to have to figure out what we can prioritize and get done and how we can 
pull it off because there is a, a lot of opportunity here, but we will be looking at internal ways to recover, you know, maybe making work more efficient. So our very limited staff can work on other items and improving processes and systems. We will look at improving our um, business uh, opportunities, especially in maritime um, for economics. And we will also look at things that are simple like uh, cam charges for our tenants, um, other things like work order recovery, uh, uh, pencils down, meat and potato things that will will help us considerably. Um, so it will be a um, all hands um, operation. Our, our whole organization understands our financial challenges. And we also understand that we're making progress to, to dig ourselves out of the hole. Yeah. Well, you know, as you're talking, uh, Director Forbes, I see this direct link between your approach to leadership and the agility that um, this agency has in terms of addressing, you know, any of those solutions that you mentioned. I mean, you know, you're the very definition of agile. So, um, you know, it's amazing. I just want to follow up on that because the teams do really try to create a learning environment because so many things are changing on the ground, you know, just even watching our visitors experiences and being out and, and listening to folks about what they're experience, you know, what they would like to see. Uh, but agility is challenging in a government entity. So we are do it we, so well. <laughs> well, we are challenged by that actually. And so we're brainstorming, you know, we, as one example, in our, in our framework, which makes perfect sense, we do long tail um, uh, solicitations to bring in restaurant, restaurant tours. We wanna give ample opportunity. We want it to be fair. We wanna enumerate our values. It can take six or seven months to get to the preferred restaurant tour. And sometimes the, the deal doesn't come through or there's problems with the arrangement and then we start again. So we've had a couple of restaurants that we just haven't filled because of this process. And, now, post-COVID, we have more vacancies. Some of our restaurants, sadly, did not make it through the pandemic. Oh. And so we've asked the commission, and the commission has directed us to do brokered RFPs and find different ways in which to bring in restaurants uh, because we, we can't have these vacancies for very long. We need to provide the opportunity bo both to the business and to the, the customer base. Um, so agility is what we aim for, but actually <laughs> putting it onto the ground can take a lot of fortitude. <laughs> Well, you could have fooled me just hearing uh, those uh, interventions and solutions uh, that you and your team have come up with, I, I, I think are extraordinary. Um, I just want to remind our audiences that this is a virtual Commonwealth Club program entitled Inside Perspective on the San Francisco Waterfront and its impact beyond the Bay Area with Elaine Forbes, Executive Director of Port of San Francisco. Um, you, you've touched on this in, in various parts of your responses to my questions so far, but being the nerd girl that I think I told you about off camera, <laughs> Let's 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 talk about the numbers a bit. I'd love to give the audience some sense of the vastness of the port's portfolio. Like how many people work for the port and how big is the budget? Okay. Um 260 employees. Um our budget is 120 million dollars. Um that's our operating budget. I said 260. We have only 230 employees. Okay. Well, we, still, need that, we need 30 more. <laughs> we need 30 more. Half of our employees are in our maintenance division. And we have many crafts from pile driving to masonry, um, complete maintenance team for the, our waterfront. Um, Pre-pandemic, pre pre we welcome 24 million people. Uh, um, we're not back yet, but we hope to go exceed that. Um, cruise is a big business for us. Uh, we welcome about 260,000 passengers a year, um, creates about 1.2 billion in wages. As I said, we have a lot of tenants to be specific. We have about 550 tenants. Um, and I did mention our operating budget of 120 million, but notably our resilience 
program will probably deliver in the in the a range of ten billion dollars of improvements. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so we are a small but mighty organization that's collaborating with many key parties to deliver big change here. Absolutely. And, you know, given the size of your team and the size of the budget, you all are able to leverage uh, considerable resources for the work that you do, the bond initiative. And I imagine some of the infrastructure uh, package money that was just passed will, will also make its way to the port and the work that you do on the waterfront. So thank you for that. Um, you know, from, from what you described, it seemed as though there were thousands of people uh, no. working. <laughs> no, no. People are always surprised by our size and it's because our impact is through our tenants and our partners. So we are much bigger uh, when you consider those 550 tenants, 550 tenants um, and our partnerships. And you, you know, the leverage comment you mentioned, Linda, is really everything to us because we got the ARPA funds as which we needed to survive 160 million. We have the, the Army Corps study, which could be a billion dollars of investment in our waterfront. We've recently gotten infrastructure dollars for the first time. It's under $10 million, but it's a huge deal to us on our small capital budget because we get to repair a major artery uh, to our maritime industrial area, Hamador Street. Um, and we have new state funding for sea level rise for urban hard edge waterfronts. First time, $145 million. And our public-private partnerships, I'll talk to you about. But we are absolutely about leveraging tenants, agreements, development agreements, partnerships. That's how we have our impact. Wow. You know, um, you're talking a lot about the port's work with environmental awareness. And I think, you know, a lot of times when, when people hear about that, it just seems like, oh, you know, there's obstacles and, and things that are um, involved with um, environmental impacts and awareness. Can you talk about how the port goes about addressing those and some specific examples? Okay. Um... So environmental impacts are really important to the port's um, jurisdiction because historically there's areas in the Southeast that had a lot of environmental contamination and neglect. Um, and so we've been involved in habitat restoration, like at um, Heron's Head Park, which is a, a wonderful place to go and uh, restores natural areas. And we've been involved in various environmental cleanups over. You can imagine in our history, in our history, we had oil companies, we had all kinds of industrial activities. And the port has been very, very engaged in ensuring a clean and safe place and habitat um, along our property. We also have sort of more uh, business oriented things like with our, our cruise ships. So we really pioneered and put in shoreside power, uh, which is super important, very, very important uh, to get our cruise ships on to clean power. Um, we have renewable fuel in our ferry boats and our excursion vessels, which is very also a small change, but an important change. It actually reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 60%. Um, and we're working right now to invest in our facilities in the Southern waterfront, our maritime industrial facilities. So we can really attract blue green businesses like electrification, offshore wind, hydrogen, because our property should be leaning in to an environmentally secure and safe planet, essentially. And we're working to do that through our uh, our tenancies. And we've had, we're having luck uh, getting state funds and federal funds into these facilities so we can attract those businesses. We also, you know, the bay water quality is huge and we have tenants right on the bay, obviously using the docks, et cetera. So we, we work a lot with them on simple things, trash, uh, how to clean the docks, one thing after another, just to make sure the operations are as clean to the bay as possible because bay water quality obviously is a, a key, uh, a key important thing. Um, I think that's, 
I mentioned the robust program about the legacies of contamination, soil sediments in the Bay. Um, so I think that gives a, a good a good snapshot. But I will say sometimes it's the small things like the big belly trash cans that tell you when to come pick up the garbage. It saves a truck trip that makes a difference. So we really think about environment through our operations. I love that. I love that. Are there other uh, greening of your operations that uh, you can think of? Um my team would tell you a lot, Linda, but for me, that's all that I, that's all the tip no of my worries. You, You've given us a lot of examples. And, you know, one of the things um, that came to mind is, you know, how can citizens get involved in sharing their ideas and getting involved in the process? You know, I mean, I, I know with your leadership style and, you know, where we are in the Bay Area, we've got great universities, we've got, you know, yes, great yes, industry and yes, mines, yes. Um, and all of our residents, I mean. Yes. You know. So we first and foremost really um, value public engagement. So the port has had citizens advisory groups set up for 20 plus years. Our commission has been on the forefront of saying, we want to co-create solutions here. You have a lease, you have a new tenant coming to us. What does the community say about that? How are they honoring the, the good neighbor policy? What's their, you know, even what, how is their facility operated? What's the, the, um, the greening or the community uh, benefits that accrue from this lease? So we have neighborhood advisory committees set up geographically and they're very, very active. Um, and so that's one way to get involved is to attend one of their meetings. Obviously sign up for notices and tracking of our meetings. We have commission meetings once a month. That's a great time to listen in and come and give public comment. You can also now dial in. Uh, we have more equitable public meetings now uh, with ability to call in. Um, and, you know, the resilience project is really a great way to get involved because there's a huge community outreach component and they have a we have a newsletter for that team um, and just ongoing engagement whether it be online uh, being interviewed being involved in a in a, a focus team or being involved in a large community meeting there are several ways to get involved in port um, another way to get involved is come down and enjoy it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> indeed indeed and then um, I'm very curious if there are um, some more specifics that you can share about any of the Embarcadero Peers programs, you know, uh, anything that you can uh, tell us about Peers 3042 or South Beach 3840 and Pier yes. 70, which is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. I'm writing down Pier 70. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, Piers 3032 and Seawall at 330. Boy, Linda, I could talk a long time about these, these sites. So Piers 3032 is a really challenging site for the port and it's been crumbling and being dilapidated for a long time. It's a 13 acre facility. It has one of our most important deep, deep self, self scouring births. So we can welcome a Marad vessel, an emergency, uh, a hospital ship in a COVID right, pandemic. Right, right. We set up our test site at that location, 2,000 tests a day. It's a really important site, but it's very expensive to rehabilitate um, because it's sitting on a bunch of concrete pilings. If, you, if you're a finance person, think of each acre of that site as creating negative land value, meaning you have to invest your way out of the facility to create the, a, a platform for development. We went out and did a public, we did a solicitation um, and we asked for the private sector to respond to what we were looking for in terms of values, which is the deep water berth for safety, the resilience improvements for sea level rise. It's a low lying area. And we wanted as many public amenities as possible. And we also wanted on the parking lot across the street to see housing. We um, got a bunch, we got three really, really, really well positioned proposals. We had a winner in Strata, um, they proposed something that made the project work, in my opinion, which is they removed six acres of the pier in order to create a beautiful new facility with swimming, both in a pool 
and on the Bay, and I can talk about equity related to that approach. I haven't spoken that much about equity, but I'd like to say no, it's next on my list. <laughs> okay. Um, and a billion plus of investment. And if we're successful at getting that through, it will be just a wonderful change in that. It's a beautiful, it's a wonderful location to see that fortified and strong and resilient for the future to see those swim facilities and that that public access and to get new housing at the waterfront is just wonderful. Um, so I'm hope I'm hopeful that we'll see that through. Any development project on the water at the port is needs uh, tenacity. Um, and I think we've got the development partner that we need. They've been great with community and great with values and they're working hard on their diversity, equity and inclusion program. Awesome. Pier 38 and 40. Um, 38 is, as I said, a really, really, really beautiful historic facility. And we're looking to rehabilitate that again uh, for earthquake and sea level rise. But that would convert um, this pier into a very active um, destination place with um, a public plaza activated with small businesses with a DEI program that actually subsidizes rents, which is a really big deal and a really good innovation. Um, and it would build waterfront recreational facilities. So I told you that our peers, our peers, a 3032 is a platform. It's no, there are no historic peers on that facility, but, um, these are these are two great opportunities. And with if we're successful on these two projects, they're located both in South Beach and we do a project in our early projects um, uh, for a breakwater, we will have a mile of protection in our seven and a half miles. We will have that accomplished. So that would just be awesome. uh, really, really amazing. Um, Pier 70. So Pier 70 will deliver up to 3000 homes, 30% of which will be affordable nine acres of new parks and open space, commercial spaces, art spaces, and inspiring historic rehabilitation. Um, we're, I know it's a lot. We're really lucky to be a public agency that can shape values through a private development project. It's a, it's a very nice collaboration to bring someone else's private money <laughs> to, to perform the values you know you need to accomplish for the public. I love it. I love it. And, you know, as I said, my next question is, how does the port enshrine equity in its work? And you told us a little bit about it, but I'd love to hear more. Yes. Um, so enshrining equity is a journey. And we're we're learning that Um I want to talk a little bit internally and then I want to talk about externally, but internally, we're really looking at the systems and the processes and the beliefs that have kept people out of, um, of the, kept people from the table essentially, um, and put, put people, um, people of color, BIPOC communities at a disadvantage. So it can be, um, as simple as, opening up the conversations, conversations about race and discussing implicit bias and the systems that have sustained and reinforced racism and harm. Um, so normalizing those conversations, also thinking about ways in which to communicate and to engage that brings all voices to the table, that really makes space and room for everyone's contribution. And um, that is actually a really important change because some voices were overpronounced and some voices were far underpronounced and making space and hearing that and making sure that folks are coming to the table. And if they're not being curious as to why and mm. checking in, checking in and being committed to that table. Um, the internal work includes things like mentorships, uh, leadership mentorships with emerging BIPOC leaders, um, mentorships across the organization. Um, it includes getting more information about how to get promoted and how to succeed. We're hiring an ombudsman to really focus on employee development. Um, it also means things like being transparent as leadership, telling folks what's going on, telling folks when you know and when you don't know what's happening, but really having 
open, transparent communications because um, part of the equity journey is to have leadership co-create with teams, have leadership transparent and accountable, and to break down some of the silos and hierarchy that we've come to uh, rely upon, which sometimes can be a little bit out of touch. And so we're working on that. In so this journey to an anti-racist organization is is a port staff journey of um, a lot of passion and a lot of work. Um, we have equity champions across our organization. We have a racial equity action plan. It has hundreds of actions which we are accountable to each year. We are meeting as a team to decide what's most important to accomplish next year what we got to this year and didn't get to this year and why we're celebrating our successes and we're acknowledging when things aren't quite working out because kind of like resilience, we're learning, we're learning, right. we're in a learning mode. But there's so much intention there. Uh, and, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it has to start from that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the equity work, starts with purposeful intention. Absolutely. And it, you really have to keep it at mind. And this is why I said we're trying to enshrine it in all aspects of our organization, because if you start looking at things through that lens, you start making the change that we need. I know we're running out of time, but I want to talk about the swim pool. Because, please, please, because, please. We have a few know, more minutes. We have oh, few good. Minutes. Well, okay. drowning, drowning is a is a cause of death that's much, much higher in African-American children than in white children. And um, I'm just using two racial groups. And it's related to having ability, having opportunity to get comfortable in the water when you're young. And the bay is a beautiful place to swim if you like cold water. And it's a beautiful part of what San Francisco offers. Um, but it's the clubs are uh, majority white and there's not a lot of diversity and swimming has been that way um, in open water. B bringing the 3032 pool in so you can see the bottom of the pool, you can get the experience of swimming being near, near the bay and you can share a locker room and a sauna and a shower with the bay swimmers and talk with one another about swimming and share swim clinics and information. This is the way communities form. And so I'm really excited about seeing this in what in open water plus swim pool opportunity to kind of open community up and bring in diversity in this in our open water swimming uh, because it is such a unique resource. That is one example of an equity um, intervention, and I, I I have several others. We have um, sailing sailing for young people that is offered mostly coming from District Ten. Um, our, our Mission Rock partners sponsored young women interested in the trades, primarily BIPOC women, sponsored them, moved them from not having ability to going through the entire trade training and to a job on the project in construction that's being built now. That's phenomenal, you it know, really to, to take someone from that sort of learning environment into where they're able to actually earn income um, and applying those skills. And, and yes, that. yes. And we have a shortage in the in the building trades. So it's it's a great, it's a win-win. Yeah, a completely virtuous circle. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, I mean, I, I, I referenced it in the bio is, the fact that the port you sprung into action when COVID uh, descended upon us, how did you get to be the first open testing site in this country? You know, I mean, this really talks to the fortitude and the capability of port staff. I mean, I, I, I know I'm a proud director, but it was really the port team was very dedicated to being public service servants in the time of challenge. So mm -hmm. we had so many people over volunteer, you know, really step up to be disaster service workers. And we saw 
our property as, okay, we're the port. How do we assist the city in this response? We're, we're a big, big property owner. And so we, we um, prepared a site for trailer housing for homeless folks in District 10. We had food distribution. Uh, we had our, our testing site. And our testing site happened because we work together, port team, who know logistics, who know how to get things on the ground, who can deliver capital works with the city team who knew what they needed in terms of the policies related to testing. And we came together and we just got it done. Extraordinary. Um, and thank goodness you were able to do that. I mean, that's a significant impact uh, as we were all suffering with that. Um, and, you know, you talked about logistics and, um, you know, Supply chain is a big topic. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you could share with our audience, you know, in terms of insights on supply chain? And Well, I mean, the, the supply chain challenges are very, very intense, obviously, for the country and what it's doing for the economics. Um, and there's a lot of investment on supply chain improvements. The state has made a big $1.2 billion investment in supply chain improvements. We are not uh, we are not causing, we're not part of the supply chain in that oh, way no. <laughs> because we're talking about containerized cargo primarily. And we have break bulk car, uh, project cargo and automobiles export. So, but what's important to understand about supply chain in our port is LA Long Beach and Oakland, the big ports that containerize big ports that have a lot of supply chain problems rely on us to do other kinds of uh, cargo. So we're part of the supply chain in that we receive this other project cargo, um, military vessels, emergency vessels, um, the, these kinds of things. So we understand that we work as a collection of ports in California um, that together provide an assembly of services that are required. Yeah. And then um, it, do you prognosis for the next few months? Is it getting better? Are we addressing, I mean, your your partners along the coast? My sense is we have a uh, we have an uh, association and we gather monthly. My sense is things are getting better. Uh, there's negotiations with labor and it, I, I sense that that uh, hopefully will come to a good conclusion. Um, and we we are slated possibly to get um, 30 million dollars in funding from the supply chain dollars to fortify armoring facilities for the types of work and the blue green work we're hoping to attract. Awesome. Awesome. And then um, you've touched on some of them, but um, what would you say are the biggest challenges facing the port right now in the work that you're doing? Being able to um, adeptly respond to what's on the ground. So really being able and you know, it's it's one thing to want to change something and to to put an intervention on the ground, and it's something altogether else to, to get it done. And so, our biggest challenge right now is we're a small little team, and we've got a lot of things that we need to adapt to and change to to put our waterfront in the most durable position uh, for its renaissance. And I think that is the biggest challenge I have is my staff is overworked. We don't have enough people, and we've got too much to do. <laughs> And we just, I mean, we know that, and we have to manage ourselves in a way that we protect our boundaries and understand and prioritize about what we can accomplish. Well, from my perspective, uh, you've got that balance and agility thing uh, down pat. You know, we've come to the uh, point in our program where there's time for only one last question. And I, I'd like to know what your vision is. Um, Director Forbes, for this port 10 years out, 20 years out, you know, what will be the big initiatives, changes and impacts for mm -hmm. residents in our city? What, what are you seeing? What do you want for us? Okay. And I see us making substantial progress on the future waterfront um, that we envision. And I see us putting projects in the ground, safety projects through our public dollars, uh, I see public-private partnerships bringing in resilience improvements, so we're more and more prepared for earthquake and flood. I also see us 
reviving and activating our fishing community at Fisherman's Wharf and really reminding San Franciscans that we are a fishing village and that we are now selling crab and fish off the boats and to come in and experience the seafood and the fishing community because it's a really important part of our identity. Um, I also see our parks and open spaces more and more used, more and more beloved, which is already so much happening. And in the Southern waterfront, I see um, more community involvement in jobs and economic opportunities, and also uh, supporting our aggregate and other uh, industrial activities and seeing, as I said, hydrogen, offshore wind, ways in which we can lean our job uh, efforts and our technologies and information, our knowledge base into the future. So we have that, that foothold. Um, I also see, you know, a plan for the ferry building. Uh, I see plans for our historic facilities. Um, and I see us continuing to welcome more and more diversity, both in the kinds of things we offer and the folks that are attracted to come here. Um, that's what I see. Awesome. Very bullish on a, a future for San Francisco and its waterfront and with ample reasons. So thank you so much um, to Elaine Forbes, um, our guest today for her comments, Inside Perspective on the San Francisco Waterfront and its impact beyond. Um, so I just... Again, want to thank you for really helping our audiences get some insight into an agency that um, not a lot of us, even people who've lived here for a number of years, have had a chance to, to learn about. So again, thank you. And so now I'm Linda Calhoun. And I'm your moderator in now this virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating 119 years of enlightened discussion is enjoyed.